Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 65 of this series. This series of lectures is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Muhammad Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. At the link below, you can find my book on Amazon. We are still on chapter eight, metabolic acidosis. Today we'll discuss high anion gap metabolic acidosis or anion gap metabolic acidosis. Let's start with the etiology of anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, many students, residents, use the mnemonic mud piles cat to remember the etiology of an iron gap metabolic acidosis. So M is for methanol, U for uremia, D for diabetic ketoacidosis, alcohol ketoacidosis, starvation ketoacidosis, D lactic acidosis, and diethylene glycol. Now the P is for paraldehyde, paracetamol or acetaminophen, fenformin or metformin, uh, propylene glycol, pyroglutamic acid or 5-oxoproline. The uh, I is for isoniacid and iron. L is for lactic acidosis. E is for ethanol and ethylene glycol. S is for salicylate. C for carbon monoxide and cyanide. A for aminoglycosides and T for theophylline. Now, if you want a summary of the etiology, this is how I remember it. Lactic acidosis, whether it's type A or B. Number two, uremia. Number three, ketoacidosis, whether it's diabetic, alcohol, or starvation, although starvation is not really going to give you much of an acidosis. And lastly, toxins like methanol and ethylene uh, glycol. Um, now, some of these etiologies, as you, you are going to see, will cause a B-type lactic acidosis. So it's not entirely uh, separate. There is some... Uh, interaction there. Let's talk about lactic acidosis. Lactic acid is the final product in the glucose anaerobic metabolism, okay? With aerobic you get pyruvate and then goes into the uh, uh, Krebs cycle. Lactate accumulation is what results in an ion gap metabolic acidosis, so the gap is from lactate. Lactic acidosis is defined as lactate over 4 mole equivalents or 4 millimole per liter. We have two types, type A and type B. In some conditions, you can have both. You can have someone with sepsis, meaning type A, who has liver failure, meaning type B. So now you have more lactic acidosis. So type A is due to hypoxia or tissue ischemia, like in shock, septic shock cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock. You can also see that in carbon monoxide poisoning, in acute hypoxia, like in acute asthma. Now, in type B, there's no tissue hypoperfusion, no hypoxia. You can see that in malignancy, liver failure. Remember, thiamine deficiency. You can have it with toxins and medications like cyanide, metformin. We just talked about fenformin, which no longer exists. Uh, metformin, salicylate, salicylate uh, toxicity, some of the acidosis is from lactic acidosis. Methanol, ethylene glycol also will cause B-type lactic acidosis. Isoniacid, we just talked about that. Propofol, propylene glycol, which is used as a, like a food additive, and you really need to ingest a heck of a lot to get uh, B-type lactic acidosis. Uh, Lancelid, um, which is a known uh, antibiotic, and isoniacid. Treatment of lactic acidosis, well, you address the underlying cause. So severe metabolic acidosis, in, including lactic acidosis, decreases cardiac output, which is not good because this will decrease contractility and blood pressure. Some clinicians, once the pH is below 7.2, would give bicarbonate to address that issue of decreased uh, cardiac uh, contractility. So in that instance, you just give enough bicarb to get the pH up to 7.2. You don't definitely don't want to normalize uh, pH. Having said that, there's no study in humans that has shown improved survival with administration of bicarbonate in metabolic acidosis. Uh, 
Therefore, giving bicarbonate to treat metabolic acidosis is a subject of great controversy. Always clinicians fight. Usually nephrologists don't really want to give it. Intensivists and cardiologists want to give it. And I told you the unbiased view. If you have a pH below 7.2, go ahead and give it. But don't think you are really treating the lactic acidosis. You still have to address the cause. Now, people who don't like to give it say that when you're giving uh, bicarbonate, uh, you are causing more hypervolemia. You are worsening intracellular acidosis because this bicarb will turn into uh, uh, carbonic acid uh, at a cellular level. You are giving bicarb as sodium bicarbonate, so that may cause hypernatremia. If the patient improves, you are going to have meta a rebound metabolic alkalosis. And because of the alkalosis, you, you are going to decrease ionized calcium. Decreased ionized calcium will cause decreased cardiac contractility. How do we give bicarbonate? Well, you can make a bicarbonate drip, an isotonic bicarbonate drip. You get a liter of 5% dextrose in water, and you add 3 amps or 150 mL equivalents of sodium bicarbonate bicarbonate to that liter and then you run it at 100 ml an hour or 150 or 200 depending on the situation. If you just give ampules meaning 50 ml of uh, sodium bicarbonate uh, it contains 50 mL equivalents and if you give it undiluted you can cause hypernatremia due to hypertonicity. What about D-lactic acidosis? This is not a common condition. If you don't think about it, you'll never diagnosis, diagnose it. Uh, when we measure lactic acid in the serum, we are only measuring L-lactate. We, we don't measure D-lactate. If you want to measure it, it's a special acid. You have to request it. So D-lactic acidosis is seen in some patients with short, small bowels, okay? After bowel resection surgery, uh, you have large delivery of carbohydrates to the colon. The bacteria would feed on that, on those carbohydrates, and produce D-lactate. D-lactate, after a big meal, will result in confusion and slurred speech. So if you get a story that this person had a bowel surgery, they have a short bowel syndrome, and every time they uh, eat a big pizza or a large carbohydrate meal, they get confused, they have slurred speech, then suspect D-lactate acidosis and then you ask for a special assay for D-lactate and the condition is treated with antibiotics to kill that uh, bacteria feeding on the uh, carbohydrate and also to have low carbohydrate diet. What about the prognosis when you have high lactate? Well, uh, it is very important. Uh, Routinely now, we check uh, lactic acid in critically ill patients. In the first 24 hours, it has a prognostic uh, value, and uh, high lactate uh, has a uh, correlation with inpatient uh, mortality. And uh, that made it uh, routine, okay? So, so we check it in the first 24 hours, and we check it subsequently. If it's very high, it's bad. If it's improving, then that would be a good sign, and it correlates with mortality. Now, uh, so we talked about a big cause of uh, uh, anion gap metabolic acidosis, which is uh, lactic acidosis, whether it's L-type or D-type. What about ketoacidosis? We said we have diabetic ketoacidosis, we have alcoholic ketoacidosis, and starvation ketoacidosis. DKA is a very important cause of anion gap metabolic acidosis. When do you see it? Well, when you see it in patients with type 1 diabetes, when they're not taking their insulin, if they quit taking their insulin. Sometimes in patients with type 2 diabetes, you see DKA if uh, their disease has been going on for a while, uh, then their pancreas doesn't make insulin anymore. So occasionally you can see it even in type 2. At any rate, the treatment is the same. Don't argue with the patient if they have type 1 or type 2. Just treat the, the condition. Okay, so DKA means insulin deficiency. Now the metabolism will turn into fatty acids. So the body needs fuel, it turns into fatty acids. Fatty acids will turn into ketones. And we have uh, three ketones in the body, acetone, acetoacetic, uh, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. How do patients present? Well, you have hyperglycemia, usually very severe, 500, 600, sometimes uh, over 1,000. You have um, osmotic uh, diuresis resulting in hypovolemia. You also have uh, an iron gap, uh, an iron gap metabolic acidosis, obviously, and multiple electrolytes problems. So uh, oftentimes you have uh, hyponatremia, 
you have hypokalemia, you have hypomagnesemia, and you have hypophosphatemia. Now, uh, some patients uh, presents with non-anion gap metabolic acidosis um, early in the course of diabetic uh, ketoacidosis. So it depends on what's going on with the urine, if, uh, if the patient is getting rid of enough uh, ketones. Um, also, later in the course, the, uh, the anion gap metabolic acidosis can turn into non-anion gap once you start getting rid of these uh, ketone salts. Now, uh, uh, the uh, preferred diagnostic test is measuring beta-hydroxybutyrate, okay? And how do we treat insulin and intravenous fluids? So when you have a patient with DKA, you are going to order beta-hydroxybutyrate, okay? Don't look just at acetone, uh, at ketone in the urine on the UA. That's not enough. So you are going to order that. You are going to transfer the patient to the intensive care unit. Don't treat them on a medical floor, okay? The, your patient should go to the intensive care unit. The, all intensive care units have protocols for DKA. So follow the protocol. The protocol is going to tell you to give intravenous fluids, different compositions, uh, depending on what's going on. Usually you have to give potassium because once you give insulin, potassium will go into the cells. So are you giving fluids with potassium? You are going to give insulin intravenously, not subcutaneously, okay? Follow the protocol. And you replace electrolytes as needed. So you are going to replace potassium, you are going to replace magnesium, you are going to replace phosphate. Now, bicarbonate therapy is almost never given because once you are giving insulin, uh, those uh, keto acids, those ketones will convert into bicarbonate, so we almost never give it. Uh, some patients present with euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, so sugar is below 200, and I've seen a few cases. If um, you are suspecting that based on the patient being diabetic, you are having an anion gap, you cannot explain the anion gap, by all means, check beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, patients who are taking sodium glucose co-transporter 2, SGLT2 inhibitors, should be monitored for euglycemic DKA. When uh, we present cases in the next lecture, um, I'm going to present a case that uh, I encountered recently on this topic. Okay, starvation can cause mild anion gap metabolic acidosis, cannot be severe, okay? It's not like the diabetic ketoacidosis. Alcohol ketoacidosis, alcohol ketoacidosis can be severe, and it's very important. You see it a lot. And make sure that you replace electrolytes, you replace fluids, you address malnutrition, monitor the patient for alcohol withdrawal, okay? Now, D5W or any fluids with, with D5 um, may be helpful. Uh, many times we give 0.9 D5 so we don't cause hyponatremia. Um, they stimulate insulin, but you have to give thiamine, okay? Uh, those patients are thiamine deficient. Uh, you don't want to end up with the uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy. So give thiamine intravenously, okay? Maybe three days, 100 milligrams IV, and then switch to oral. So when, whenever I see an alcoholic, I always give them thiamine intravenously. Then I'll give uh, uh, 0.9 D5, replace whatever needs to be replacement. And also I usually add the multivitamin and folic acid. What about salicylate toxicity? Very important to remember. You have to suspect it in some patients. Some people overdose. Obviously, they're not always going to tell you. So salicylate or uh, salicylic acid is an organic acid. PKA is 3, so at physiologic pH is completely dissociated. Now, the unionized fraction, the undissociated fraction, is what determines the toxicity. So this fraction increases as pH becomes more acidemic. So what are we going to do to decrease the toxicity? We want to make the patient more alkalotic, okay? We want to fight the acidosis. So therefore, we are going to treat salicylate toxicity with alkalization, okay? Now, usually salicylate toxicity is going to cause an ion gap metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So the patient is going to be hyperventilating. In children, we see more anion gap metabolic acidosis than respiratory alkalosis, but in adults, the respiratory alkalosis is more predominant. Always look at the anion gap. Remember what we said uh, at an earlier lecture about the six steps needed to uh, diagnose any uh, metabolic acidosis. Why do we get anion gap metabolic acidosis with salicylate toxicity? Well, it's not just salicylate, which is an acid. Uh, it's lactate and sometimes even ketone. You can get a little bit of ketosis. We have to alkalinize. Uh, 
we have to give sodium bicarbonate drip, like I said, D5 with three amps of sodium bicarbonate, and you give enough, check your pH, make sure it's above six, preferably close to seven, okay? When you do that, you enhance excretion of salicylic acid, and then everything is good. If you get a patient with severe toxicity, you have mental status changes, the patient is not awake, they're hallucinating, they're confused, or if serum salicylate is over 80, consult your nephrologist. You do dialysis, you get rid of salicylate very, very effectively. It's very dialyzable. Don't wait. Pyroglutamic acidosis is not a common cause of an iron gap in metabolic acidosis. Maybe I've seen one case. It is rarely seen in some critically ill patients, even with regular doses of acetaminophen. So patients at risk are those with malnutrition, liver disease, alcoholism, and chronic kidney disease. Now, when you are giving acetaminophen to these patients who already have a reduced level of glutathione, you are going to get accumulation of a metab metabolite called pyroglutamic acid or 5-oxaproline. This causes mental status changes. Now, you can only measure 5-oxaproline in very specialized labs you can do it in the blood or you can do it in the urine. So if you have a 9-gap metabolic acidosis, someone, like I said, took uh, some acetaminophen, you don't have any other explanation, maybe then order the test. Methanol and ethylene glycol toxicities are very important and very, very common. So both result in severe 9-gap metabolic acidosis with a osmolar gap. So what we said, when you're suspecting toxicity, calculate osmolar gap. Both toxins can be ingested either accidentally or intentionally, okay? How do we calculate osmolar gap? Well, first measure serum osmolality, and then you calculate it and you, you get the difference. What is calculated osmolality? So it's sodium times 2, BUN divided by 2.8 plus glucose divided by 18. If you're using um, uh, international units, uh, millimoles per liter, you don't need to divide by anything. Normal serum osmolality is 280 to 295, and uh, over 310 is a significant hyperosmolality. The lethal dose of methanol is 60 to 250, while of ethylene glycol is about 100 ml. Methanol and ethylene glycol and regular ethanol alcohol, are all of them are metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase. So in case of methanol, it's metabolized to formaldehyde and then it's converted to formic acid, which is very toxic, especially to the retina. So people will go blind, sometimes permanently, from methanol. Now, ethylene glycol is also metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to glycolic and oxalic acid. This is why you see calcium oxalate crystals in the urine. So if you get a question with patient ingested something, then they show you a picture with calcium oxalate, they look like little envelopes, then the diagnosis is ethylene glycol toxicity. So when people ingest methanol, uh, one case I saw someone, believe it or not, ingested hairspray, and hairspray contains methanol. So uh, they presented with abdominal pain, seizures, coma, or blindness. Um, now, both methanol and ethylene glycol cause inebriation, so they appear drunk. It can, in case of ethylene glycol, also progress to seizures and coma. Some patients develop pulmonary edema and acute kidney injury. I've seen maybe three patients with ethylene glycol toxicity who went on to end-stage renal disease. They're, they never uh, recovered their acute kidney injury. How do we manage uh, methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity? Well, uh, we give intravenous fumpizol, which inhibits alcoholic, alcohol dehydrogenase, and that prevents formation of toxic metabolites. If you don't have it available, use intravenous ethanol, 5 or 10% solution. Usually, uh, sodium bicarbonate is given intravenously. Most patients, though, will need dialysis. So anyone with a smaller gap over 10, bicarb below 20, pH below 7.3, oxalate crystals in the urine will need hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is very effective. Uh, some people, especially for uh, ethylene glycol toxicity, will give uh, vitamin B6 and B1. That's fine to do. Uh, 
Um, it's worth mentioning that there are other toxic alcohols that can result in metabolic acidosis, including diethylene glycol, that uh, this is a compound used in many industries, uh, propylene glycol, and isopropanol. I'm going to uh, end here in the next lecture. We are going to discuss some cases on metabolic acidosis. See you then.